to a COVID-19 360 time to interact with our experts. And again, Ghana's case count at the moment is at 1,671 with 16 recorded deaths. Now, the conversation now is more about the lifting of the lockdown and how it looks as if Ghanaians feel the, uh, you know, the pandemic has gone down in the country and as a result are not really adhering to the precautionary measures. And so really, what could be the worst case scenario and what could happen if this lifting of lockdown continues and people still disregard the precautionary measures? Right behind me, I have my doctors. And so Dr. Newman Arthur yesterday gave us some 12 key points on all the positives that we can identify from COVID-19. And so yesterday we enjoyed that session with you. And so you're welcome back. And also we have back with us this morning, uh, Dr. Betha Sewa'ai, who's an infectious disease specialist. And so good to have you back. And I hope yesterday you missed us. <laughs> yes, I did. You very did. much. Well, welcome back. We all missed you as well. And so let me start off with you, Dr. Betha. I'll come back to you, Dr. Newman. Today we're still going to touch on the, the positives of COVID-19. But Dr. Betha, so at this point, people seem to be getting tired. We have what we call corona fatigue because people even hear about corona and they're like, okay, not again, let's move on. Ghana has lifted the lockdown so we can go about our duties and everything. And we're recording more cases. Our numbers uh, in terms of death has also increased as well. What really is happening? Does it mean that we're not really paying attention to it? And maybe was it a wrong idea to have lifted the lockdown? the decision of the leadership. Um, they know all the factors that they considered before they um, embarked on removing the lockdown. We don't know all the extenuating circumstances, so to speak. However, I think there should be a countermeasure. The, one, the minute we've taken off the lockdown, there should be more education so that people will understand what the disease is and what they can do. Yes, it appears that maybe the people who can understand and speak and read and write English may have fatigue. But there's a lot more people, those in Kotokraba market, those in Takrade, you know, those in Northern region. We need to reach more people because our nation is not based in Accra. Our nation is the whole country. So we have to make sure that we're getting our messages out there in as many languages as we can. And we also have to have a way of enforcing the social distancing, meaning in the markets or in the, there should be little signs on the floor that tell people, where to stand. That's how a lot of um, developed countries have solved the social distancing problem. Even mm. if you use paint to mark on the floor that can only stand here and here and here. Otherwise, I realize that as a people, we're used to crowding. You yeah. ask us to go for food, we're not going to form a nice queue. People are just going to rush. Even when you form a queue, people will rush. And so we, we always have to be aware of those factors and, and continue to educate as many people as we can. I don't think all is lost. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of hope that with continued efforts, we'll be able to make a lot of progress. And yesterday, I noticed that on social circles, it appears that Ghana has come up with a, an antibody test. And yeah. so if all these things are rolled out on a massive scale, we'll be able to get a better idea of where our disease parts are. And um, I think we'll be able to gain control of the situation. So in terms of gaining control, at what point are we on the curve? Because now the curve has become very popular when talking about COVID-19. There's flattening of the, of the curve. It's rising at one point. You know, it's reducing at another point. What point are we as a country looking at our numbers? I still think we're at an exponential stage. I mean, we're following a route that the virus characteristically follows when it enters any community, meaning there will be spread. But I think what the government is doing in terms of making sure they are tracking as many cases as possible will help. I mean, definitely you can't reach every nook and cranny of uh, the society. But I think the little, you know, what they know how to do, um, they are doing it well. We need to make sure that more of our healthcare providers, I understand there are 13 people who have been infected, healthcare yeah. providers, and they were not in the treatment center. So I take it to mean that maybe for one reason or the other, they had relaxed on their personal protective equipment. So we need to make sure that all those things are, I mean, I mean, even myself, sometimes after taking care of a few of those patients, you gain some false sense of confidence that, oh, now I can go close. And mm -hmm. you quickly have to remind yourself that, look, this is a disease that kills. Make sure you are still executing as much. So I can identify with the corona fatigue. Oh, now there are three of them. Okay, this one has this and 
you know, you, you can't forget that, well, this is the same disease that was killing thousands of people in Italy. So I think that reminder is important, which is why it validates why we're doing this program every yeah. day to remind people that it's, it's alive and kicking. Definitely. So, so then, Dr. Newman, yesterday you gave us some 12 happy points, I could put it that way. And, you know, the conversation was that if doctor is telling us to think of the positive sides of it, then maybe the negativity about COVID-19 is not as bad. So we can still go about living our lives anyway. And once we think positive, we'll be fine. What do you think the psychological effect of this could be on all of us? I think that the, the goal of information is to help people understand when they get to understand, then they are able to uh, assign proportionate uh, measures and emotions to the varied you know, information that has been given. If you don't balance the information, they may be too afraid to do what they are supposed to do well. If you give the other side of the information too much to, they may be so relaxed that they may not even take the precautions they are supposed to take. So you need to always give the right information in a certain balanced way. And so that is why in this program, we both do the psychology bit of it and do the other aspects of it so that we have some balance in the information so that people's responses may be balanced. And I think that, for example, for me, I'm not afraid, but I'm very cautious mm. because of what I know. So that is what we need to do. It's like we need to give them the full information so that they are cautious and also and not afraid. And that is, that is the balance people need. Because if they get to understand, because we as doctors, we take all the precautionary measures because we know what it is. But mm -hmm. we are also not openly afraid about it because we know what it is. Yeah. And I think that that is. So if someone is not taking precaution, it means the person doesn't understand the disease yet. And if someone too is overly afraid, it means the person also doesn't understand the disease yet. So that balanced information is what people need. Mm -hmm. If we give them all negatives all the time, they'll be too afraid to do the right things. If we give them the positives all the time, they'll be too relaxed to do the right things. But yeah. we need that kind of... We, we need that. Now, if I have yes, a, a strong mental health, they say that your mental health is what uh, determines your overall health as well. So let's just say that I'm identifying some of the, uh, the symptoms that may lead to coronavirus, and I may have it, but I'm like, okay, well, I'm so strong. I'm praying. I'm hoping that things are going to get better. And as a result, I avoid um, you know, going to the hospital, seeing the doctors and all that. Could that help? Uh uh, can you repeat it again? What Sorry. I mean by could that help is, so maybe I, it could boost my immune system and indirectly my mental health can fight the virus, so I would be fine. So then I don't necessarily have to go and see a doctor? Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the mental health, you know, is, doesn't work in isolation, right? It works with other things. So, for example, if you have hypertension, blood pressure will go up if you don't take your medication. In addition to that, if you are overly afraid and panicking and overly stressed, that stress is going to influence the control of the blood pressure. So whilst you're taking the drugs and you are reducing your stresses and anxieties and all that, the combination is what makes the control of blood pressure effective. Mm -hmm. So you need combination, you know, therapy, mentally, emotionally, socially, physically, spiritually. You need that. Com that is what we call holistic care, where you use all the approaches to make sure that the person is it's the person's needs, health needs are addressed fully. So mental health issues do not work in isolation. In addition to mental health, with all the physical, social, and spirituality, the, the combination is what makes sure that people, you know, become totally well, mm. right? So, you, okay, I have positivity, I'm not afraid and all that, so the virus, <laughs> the virus won't do what it has to do. The virus may be doing what it has to do, but you need both whatever, everything we are telling you, together to be able to make sure that the person's holistic health care needs are, are met. So that is, that is what it is. Okay, Dr. Bertha, yesterday there was a report about some 10 food vendors and three taxi drivers who tested positive for COVID-19 at the Achimota General Hospital. And these are people who may have come into contact with God knows how many more people. How bad could this be? And looking at this situation, could we not have prevented it? Well, um, the only way I can understand that it's concerning because, you know, at the very, very beginning of the outbreak, 
there were reports of a Singaporean um, Uber driver who had tested positive and Uber therefore, you know, gave a few directives as to what to do. Yes. Um, the only way to prevent this or could have, we could have prevented this is we may have to consider these people as essential workers, even though they are not healthcare workers. Anybody who comes into frequent contact with the public, once we're saying we should go back to our normal way of living, all these people should have targeted um, testing, especially since we now have some type of antibody test. So immediately that's what comes to mind. I'm sure there are other innovative ways of including educating all these um, drivers, but and even the market women, but clearly very, very concerning. Mm, that, that means that there could possibly be a second lockdown if we keep recording cases like this, right? Um, I doubt if there will be. I haven't seen any country that has gone to a second lockdown. They would usually extend their lockdowns or maybe they'll say we're gradually easing back. But we, we lifted it in a way. Although I won't say we've completely lifted it because we're still practicing social some form distancing. of social. The fact that our yeah. schools and our churches are not meeting. We still have funerals limited to, I believe, less than 25 people. Those are all very, very important measures. You know, so I think that we're still, do we should not suddenly go back to school. Um, we should keep large gatherings because the virus is still very well and alive. In fact, yesterday I, I glanced at an article. I didn't quite read it. It was talking about the fact that besides the fact that when you have large crowds, there's more transmission. Some people have actually measured the virus in the air, in the atmosphere where there's a crowd. And they've shown that just the air in a crowded area has a large amount of virus. And so maybe that's what even causes the transmission. It's not so much whose hand you shook mm. or who you talked to when you were in a crowd. So if you have a large beach where there are lots of people, the environment becomes charged with the virus. So I think, back to your question, we should do some targeted testing of all these individuals. But what if after two weeks, because we're still waiting to hear from the president concerning, um, you know, the ban on social gatherings, children going to school, and all of that, churches also converging as well. What if after two weeks, that ban, that ban is also lifted? Would it be advisable? Um, it will not be advisable, but if you go around the world, from Sweden to United Kingdom. Sweden, I believe that today they are, they are reopening everything just back to normal. Um, U United States is battling with this. Florida beaches are open. Um, it is a big, it's a big um, leadership dilemma at this time for almost every um, country because they're having to grapple with, and it's not just the reopening. It's the fact that it's hitting people's pocket, that mm. the effect on the social economic structure of a country so i mean it like china was able to do it so well because they moved everything to online i don't know if we can do that i mean there was yesterday i was in a program where they showed us the streets of china when there was the lockdown there was nobody on the street zilts no one people were in their homes food was being delivered medications everything was really really high tech in fact the who said they don't know of any nation that will be able to duplicate what they did, you know? Yeah. But And they were able to. Now they are completely out of their lockdown. But as they said, they said, look, we are not letting our guards down. We're not going to be fooled into thinking this virus is over at all. So back to our, our own context, I don't think it will be advisable. But I'm sure the administration is under a lot of pressure. I mean, I'm just, I'm a church goer myself. I'm just imagining the pressure that this is putting on churches. If you have a large church building, you're still having to pay um, rent. Maybe the government will pick up your electricity, but you have to be paying your workers. Mm. I mean, all of this is a lot of stress on, I'm sure, a lot of churches. And, and, and parents have gone back to work, but children are at home. Who is going to watch their children? Do you take them to the market and expose them? So um, this, I believe, is, is a challenge of, 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 of leadership. I mean, this whole pandemic, from the WHO director to the the smallest country president. It's been a challenge of how to lead, what to do, because people are having to make on the spot decisions and, and not simple decisions. So, I mean, I don't know what the administration is going to decide to do, but I mean, it, it, all, for all intents and purposes, if we're going to keep our numbers down, um, it may not be the appropriate time. Although what they've touted is that it looks like 
the, the, our disease severity index is not as high as in other countries. Mm. People seem to have mild cases for God knows um, what reason. Okay. Now, now, Dr. Newman, there was a funny video I came across last week. I think it was in India. They're still under lockdown, and it's very likely that they might even... I, I know they've extended it as well. Now, there were some people who decided to flout the lockdown rules. The police caught them, put them in an ambulance with another person who was faking to be uh, a coronavirus patient. I don't know if you saw it, but it was very hilarious. But I just thought about the kind of effect it was going to have on these people such that they would never want to leave their homes again. Coming to Ghana, we have lifted our lockdown, but there's also a directive to wear your face mask and also to educate more people. Can we start adopting some of these interesting um, you know, measures in order to let people really understand how serious this is? And what could be the effect it would have on all of us? I, 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 well, I think that that was, that was in, that, the, the right word is interesting. It, yeah. it, may, it may set a kind of fear and change their behavior in a way, but you realize that fear-provoking things may um, may do some work over a short time. If they realize that it's all fake, they will go back to normal. But you need a certain measure that will can be maintained for a while. You know, and that measure would have to be de determined by the government and enforced. Because whatever you do, there are people who don't understand what is going on. And there are people who will not comply, even if they understand. Actually, there are people who don't care. You know, there are some people who come to you for some therapy and they, they, they actually don't care about anything. It's like mm. whatever you do, do if I... I die, you know, and they're already struggling with something and they, they just don't care. And so if those who don't care will put everybody else, you know, life in danger, then we need a certain measure by the government, which is in the confines of the law, where there's an agreement that this is the measure and this is the appropriate, you know, force or the appropriate measure to use to control a certain human behavior. And that would help. But we can't allow people to do what they want to do. Right, but that measure should should be measured based on all the you know consultations from all, all kinds of angles to know that this is appropriate and, let, and let's implement it. Because whatever you do, there are people who just don't care about anything. But and those mm -hmm. uh, just have to be gone. But it, is it not funny that once uh, we're all out going about our duties and people are being asked to wear their face mask, it looks as if the conversation about washing your hands regularly, using the sanitizer. That has gone down the drain, and everybody seems to be focusing only on making sure I have my face mask. Yeah, it's, it's the information. You see, the brain, the brain is very, very powerful. You know, everything you hear, everything you see, the brain will process it. You know, it, it goes into all kinds of things, results in a certain emotional response, then an action is taken, right? So it, it starts from the information level. And I keep saying, we think everybody watches TV or everybody listens to the radio. They don't. And a lot of people follow. So they go to town, they see a lot of people mask. They also want to wear because of what they, they, they see. And that is purely that. If the education doesn't go down too well, you know, you, you can't expect people to do what they have to do because what they see or hear or uh, whatever it's uh, happening around them, it's like it. For example, if they enter into a community and there's nothing even happening in the community, but everybody in the community is wearing a red dress. The likelihood that the person is going to pick a red dress and wear will be very high mm. because they've seen a group of people wearing a, and they feel odd and they may assign meaning to it and they are likely to follow. And that is human behavior. Human behavior is modeled after many things that people see or happen in a certain environment. So if everybody is washing their hands, everybody is in face masks, it is likely that someone would, 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 would fall in place. Let me give you a typical example. Let me use a school as an example. I work the Wesley Girls High School, right? You go there mm. in the first month. Let's say if you're a first, a first year student, the first month, you know, you came with all your baggages, right? Everything yeah. all over the place. But, you know, within a week, everybody seems to fall in line because they go and meet a certain system. That is so robust, so structured, so ordered. Everybody is doing everything in a certain particular way. <laughs> you know, you, you go and speak to them in the first week, everybody is all over the place. By the next week, you go and the same students who came from outside and they are doing everything they want to do now are falling in line because of what they go, they go and meet. And that is what it is. You know, so behaviors can be modified in several ways, especially if we maintain a certain kind of structure and measure.
In okay. Africa, we do things because we don't really have a certain way of doing things. So mm. anybody who comes in society does not follow. But if we have a certain structured measure around this season, everybody else is likely to follow. Okay. All right. Well, there are some questions from our viewers as well. So Anita will handle that. Okay. So this one says, hi, Bella and Anita. Oh, good morning. My name is Emmanuel Edwin Tiam, in Tiam Mwa from so on. Please, I'm asking that the face mask during the evening time, I don't see people putting on the mask. My question is that, uh, does the virus not spread in the evening? Because most people don't put the nose mask on in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Trees that have uh, come up with curfews as well, because sometimes they ask that doesn't mean that the virus only uh, you know is transmitted at a certain time and not a certain time. That's a better. No, I mean clearly it's transmitted all <laughs> the whole day, <laughs> and the, the question reminds me of the mosquito nets. You know, those who have. I mean, when we were and I went to Wesley Girls by the way. So when Dr. Newman was talking, I was laughing. I mean, we we had to use mosquito nets when we went to bed. And it was good. It protected us at night. But the question that people have asked is that, okay, so you use a mosquito net at night. So what about during the day when there's no mosquito net? What will you do? Mm. I told them, well, you are more awake. So you are more likely to um, drive the mosquitoes away yourself just by virtue of your movement. So, yes, um, the person has asked a good question. The mask should be used probably until you are going to bed and you know you are not going to interact with other people. It's not a daytime mask at all okay <laughs> okay so i guess he, he has been answered this one says hi anita and Bella. please ask dr bertha how the first person got the virus and what is the difference between the coronavirus which occurred in 2003 and the coronavirus now yeah so they are actually very very similar they have what they call 96 percent homology meaning when they look at the genetic material of the virus it has only 4% genetic material that is different. And it, it presents pretty much the same way, um, except that one had a high mortality, about 30%, meaning 30 out of 100 people died, whereas this one has a mortality of 1%. Secondly, they both started in China, um, from, from a district in China. So there are a lot of similarities, which makes people think, did someone tweak the same virus a little bit? Um, and that's why we have this, but I don't want to go there at this time. And it also explains why this one is called SARS-CoV-2, because it was so similar that instead of just calling the other one SARS, that one became renamed as SARS-CoV-1, and this one is SARS-CoV-2. They both affect the respiratory system, and they are both coronaviruses. So they are very, very similar. How did it start? I don't know. Um, we just know that it has almost a good a good portion of this genetic material seems to be similar to the the coronavirus found in bats. And people have questioned, is it the type of food that the Chinese were eating? Mm -hmm. I don't know, because even in Ghana and Kenya, they've done our scientists have been doing studies on coronavirus bats forever. And we know that our bats carry some type of coronavirus. They're just not able to um, cross over and infect humans. And I keep giving the keyhole analogy that animal viruses cannot infect human viruses because they don't have the apparatus to open the, the, the door to our cells. So it, somehow, when they're able to make a photocopy of a key that can open the doors to our cells, then they come in. So some type of mutation must allow an animal coronavirus to obtain the key that opens the doors to human cells. And so that is why this disease is being called a zoonosis. We don't know whether it started in a lab, but there was a book that was written by somebody in 1980. That's about 40 years ago. My son keeps asking, mom, why aren't we interviewing the author of this book? Because in the book, the person talks about a, a virus from Wuhan city. He talks about a lab. They mentioned Russia, US and, um, China working on a lab and how somebody was working in the lab, something happened, they got infected and they left the lab and infected a bunch of children. And finally, one woman who was looking for her son found her son. But the difference is that the virus in that book was attacking the brain and the brain melts within four hours, except this little boy was not dying. 
I mean, there's so many similarities between that book written 40 years ago, the city, the location, the lab, the countries involved, even professors who were fired from their jobs because they were selling information between countries that people have wondered, is it the same thing? Did the, did the author know something about this thing that's going to happen 40 years later? But you know what? At this point, we want to focus on getting better. Yesterday, I was giving an analogy to someone that if you have bees, a swarm of bees in your house and they are biting everybody, your immediate goal is to protect people. You're not going to start asking Kofi and Ama who opened the door, who went to the beehive. I mean, at this point, we don't have the time to be wondering who let the bees out. We just know they're in our houses and we have to get them out. So that is an answer to the question. Okay, another okay, one. So this one says, good morning, Anita and Bella. Please ask your experts if the asymptomatic carriers can recover unknowingly because of the nature of the virus. <laughs> Whether they can recover unknowingly. Yes. Yes. I mean, clearly, that is why they recover. We, they, don't, they don't even know they have symptoms. They don't even know they're ill. And so they're going to recover without knowing. And usually the antibody test in combination, which is the IgG, IgM, the thought is that once you have an infection, the IgG will last for several months, if not forever. And so that's the only way we're going to be able to know. But there'll be a lot of, I mean, think of stars like Idris Elba, Kevin Durant, and a few other people. If they had never gotten the test, they would never know they're infected. And I think the last time I was sharing the story of a family where the six-year-old was PCR positive, antibody positive. And if it wasn't because it was under a research condition or maybe the physician decided to test all of them, that little boy would never know that he had it. We wouldn't know the two-year-old in the house has even had it and recovered and never showed a sign. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Okay, so this one says, good morning, Bella and Anita. I've been having sore throat for about two months now. I went to the clinic several times and I've taken a lot of medications and I'm crying to you through uh, to get me through to any doctor to find out whether it can be COVID-19 and how long a symptomatic person can live. Hmm. Throat for two months is concerning. Um, the person needs to at least, if not, the person, I think at this point, the person needs an ear, nose, and throat physician to look down their throat because most causes of sore throats, group A strep, um, mild coronaviruses, infection, or whatever, they usually last about a week. So if you have symptoms for two months, um, you have to think of where the what what causes sore throat. It's inflammation of the larynx and the nasal pharynx. Mostly the larynx, your voice box. So, and it can be several things. It could even be tuberculosis. Tuberculosis causes the form of laryngitis. So if you've had a sore throat for that long, somebody needs to be looking down. It could even be cancer, for example. You would think it's a sore throat, but there's something growing on that um, part of the respiratory lining. It could be cancer, tuberculosis, it could be anything. Sometimes it could even be a thyroid tumor pressing on the on the larynx. So it shouldn't be taken lightly. The person should ask that they be referred to a higher level where a specialist will look down their throat to make sure if it's just a simple sore throat or it's something else. Okay. Well, on that note, doctors, thank you so much for speaking to us. And Dr. Newman, uh, definitely tomorrow. I don't know if you're going to give us some more, you know. <laughs> we're looking for it. It's more hope, right? And Dr. Newman Arthur yeah. is a clinical psychologist. And also Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi. Thank you always yes. as well for coming through for us. And she is an infectious My disease pleasure. specialist. Have a good day. We do um, for teleconsultation. You know, <coughs> definitely. But have a good day. Thank you so much. And well, yes, it's still COVID-19, 360. We have